everyone. Today I have with me screenwriter and director whose works are seen on PBS, Pamela Peake. Hi, Pam. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Thank you so much for talking with me today. I, I'm so happy that I found you on LinkedIn, and I, was, I started to look at your, uh, the trailers for your movies, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I really want to talk to her. So thank you so much for talking with me. Well, you're very welcome. Um, your first, the first screenplay you did for them, was that colorblind? Was that the first one? Yes, and actually it was a documentary, but it's interesting because, well, there's a documentary, and then there's a docudrama that's very much like a screenplay. Mine was kind of right in the middle, but we still called it a documentary. Hmm. Okay, and, and when I was looking at it, like, it, it said it was kind of autobiographical. But yes, it certainly was. Okay, fact, so how was that? How did that, you know, happen? Because that, that's well, awesome. I always yeah. think that screenplay or screenwriters should write, like, their own story. But they don't always, but I think that, that it's awesome that you did. Yes. Well, you know, it didn't even start out as a documentary, and I had not done anything for PBS at first. But the way it started out was I had gone through a very tragic period in my life. My sister-in-law and best friend had died of breast cancer, and then um, I went to court to become the mother of my niece and nephew, and it was a very exhausting number of years. So sitting, and it's interesting, I want to add this, at UC Irvine, I went to see a motivational speaker, and you know, I don't even remember her name, but my husband said, I want you to come to UC Irvine, I'm in, in Orange County, California, and see this great motivational speaker. Well, I got so motivated, evidently, (laughs) <laughs> that I went, I mean, I, to this. I, I often would like to thank this woman, but I actually do not remember her name. I only remember feeling very inspired. I came home and I thought, I've been through so much in the last number of years with my sister-in-law's death. I thought, I need to uplift myself. And this is before Facebook. I think it was 2003. And mm-hmm. I started looking for these kids that I went to grade school with in the 1960s that I always knew as brothers and sisters, but the riots hit Detroit and all of our families moved out to the suburbs and we never saw each other. We went from four and a half to 12 years old. And I just, it all started coming together. They all loved this one teacher. He was the first black teacher at our school. And the next thing you know, we were having a reunion and Diane Sawyer sent a crew to come to our little grade school reunion in Detroit. Wow. It was so moving. Yeah. And by coincidence, um, my third grade boyfriend, Kenny, who you'll see on the Colorblind website, uh, my third grade boyfriend, Kenny, his nephew was the producer of American Chopper, or just becoming the producer, and he brought, he, he brought him in to take movies or videos of the entire weekend. So not only did we have footage from Good Morning America, who did a beautiful story some months later, but we also... Uh, we also had the beautiful footage from Adam Moyer, who's the producer of American Chopper. Wow. So it, was destined. it was destined to become a documentary. <laughs> so what? So then you, you knew you had, like, that stuff. So then what did you have to write? Like, how did you write it about okay, what well, had happened? Well, the way I knew I had something in that story, first of all, and this is something that writers need to know, if you have a story and you say it to a number of people and they react, chances are you have what's called a high concept. And a high concept is something that's very marketable. Um, it's for a certain specific age range. And it's something a producer could take and sell. Well, every time we told this very moving story, and remember, again, it was before Facebook where we can now easily find people. It was not easy to find three right. members of our class and the teacher because teachers don't give out the phone numbers usually, but we found our beloved Mr. Bell. Um, but anyway, um, uh, let's see, what was I saying? I was saying that uh, it wasn't easy to find them, and when I would tell people about the story, they go, they gasp and go, I'm so moved, or they go off and search for people that they or classmates that they hadn't seen. And so I thought, this is really something. Well, I didn't mm-hmm. see the footage that Adam Moyer had, and it came Federal Express about a month later. And when I popped it into my camera and I watched it, I, my husband and I sat there and I go, 
this would make a great moving documentary. I've got to do this. So it was a high concept, something very marketable that people could identify with. And I knew, I, I felt moved enough to do it. So I called, listen to this. I had been writing all my life. Um, but I've been writing things for stage a lot and short stories. So I met this student at Chapman University Film School, and he introduced me to what I now know very well, which is um, the three-act concept by Sid Fields, which I'm <laughs> sure a lot of your, your writers know. So I discussed it with him, and we decided how to put this in the exact three acts with the exact requirements for all three acts. And I swear that is what told the story so well that it won film festival awards like crazy. I think we were in 20 film festivals and we won five or six best documentaries. And, um, and then when I brought it to PBS, it was a shoe in It was totally PBS material. It was historic and all of that and a moving story. And it was about race relations and all, all of that. That is, that's an amazing story. What made you think like PBS? Like what made you think, you know what, I'm taking this to PBS uh, as a well, documentary. That's interesting. I started working for a while. Um, well, I'll tell you what it was. I went to film festivals and I traveled around. I think I went to probably like about 15 out of the 20 film festivals that Colorblind was at. And I started meeting producers and I met a producer's rep in Hollywood and I worked with her for a while. And just to learn the ropes, and I helped other, other people's films get placed with distributors. So I started looking at all these distributors, and I think I, I ordered the book on all the places you can distribute your film. Now you can get that online. And as I read about each one, yes, I sent it to some smaller companies, but I didn't want Colorblind to be buried. I thought, my God. If this concept was great. Oh, by the way, I had Dateline NBC and Diane Sawyer's office, Good Morning America, fighting over who wanted this story. Wow. Like, That's how you know you've got something. You know, it clicks with people. It's something unique. It has a hook. Okay, white kids honor a black teacher they haven't seen since they were little, and he changed our life um, to be colorblind, right? And when we reunited, it was so tearful. That, that's something that's a high concept. Well, I chose right. Diane Sawyer's office, obviously, because – they understood the heart of it. But going back to the distributors, when I read the mission of PBS, I said, that's fantastic. So I mailed it to American Public Television, which is their distributor, and I heard back from them immediately that they were interested in the story. Wow. That is such a great story. <laughs> I'm just like, yes. like and, wow. And I want, to, I want to tell... I want to tell any of your listeners that PBS is a really great way to get your film seen if it matches their mission statement. And it's interesting because I learned a lot. I, I've always been okay on post-production, but PBS it demands that your post-production is absolutely fantastic. And at first, my sound engineer and my videographer thought, why are they so picky? Well, you know why they're so picky? I realized this later. They have little stations like in Alaska or the Ozark Mountains or all over the place, and you have to hit the highest standard when it comes to visuals and audio because those are unmanned TV stations and the things just play automatically. So I am very grateful that I went through the hell as a producer also of making my film a very high quality. Remember, we, we were just taping this and it was a reunion, but we made it such a high quality that now I work standardly at that high quality. It's really a learning curve, but it's something wonderful to learn. That's that's amazing. And you know what? I have always, I, you know, I'm just thinking back to, like, all the documentaries that I've watched on PBS. Like, they are, like, the reason PBS watches their stuff is because it is such high quality, you know? Yeah. So it makes yeah. sense that, that that was, you know, that that's the experience you got from them because – I, I don't know if people understand that as much, and so it's it's a good thing for people to hear about that, you know, cause if yeah, you because wanna... if you want to – go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, I would say, I would say you can get mad at it at first. Like, why are they being so picky? I remember a few meetings where we were like, okay, we got to go back in and we got to clean up the sound of this this mm. 
interview taken in a high ceiling in an old school back in in Detroit. You know what I mean? We did right. it. In fact, at one point we did automatic dialogue replacement because we just couldn't get it so it would go out over the airwaves for some of those really small stations. And I and once I understood their plight, I said, okay, I can chip in. I can be a team player and I can do this no matter what work it takes or what it costs. And it did cost, but it was worth it. Um, another nice thing about, as a writer, writing a documentary on PBS is you you put your email address. And we also had a call in line. Um, and you sell your DVDs. And I sold a lot of DVDs on both my films. But the nice thing is, is I got phone messages, thousands of phone messages and beautiful emails. I saved them all because the film was so moving. It was both black and white audiences. And most of them would say they were channel surfing, and they go, I mm. came across your moving documentary, and, and I had a teacher who changed my life. <laughs> so it was mm. really cool. I, I highly recommend it. It's a great experience. And the programming directors are absolutely wonderful. I got to know them, and that's what made it easy for me to bring my second film to them. Was, is Color Blind out on a DVD still? Can people get that on Amazon? You know what? No, where you can get it is on my um, on my uh, website, www.colorblinddocumentary.com. I actually think that PBS is still playing it, um, even though the license is expired. It's just such a love film. And all of a sudden, I'll sell a bunch of DVDs, and I think, well, some station somewhere is still playing it. It was out for four years. Wow, we'll, we'll definitely link that to this video so people can just press on the link and go directly there. So we'll, Great. we'll do Great. that. And, and I recommend, if they want to see the trailer, I recommend going on the front page and looking to the left of the picture and seeing the director's cut. That's the five-minute trailer that will really give you the idea of it, okay? Oh, amazing. Okay, so then, all right, so you get done with Colorblind. Right. And then yep. what happens? Like, do you start just, you're like, okay, I can write, I can do this because I'm amazing now. Right. And <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. I'm always learning right now. I am in a screenwriting master class at something I highly recommend screenwriting you. It's just the word screenwriting with a you. I, yep, and I know. Hal- I'm familiar. Yes. Yes. Hal Crosman is the teacher there and I am in the middle of uh, the master class, I never stop learning. Maybe I want to learn a new genre. Maybe usually I write dramas, um, but right now I'm working and actually I've just finished a screenplay of Colorblind, and I have several others. But what happened in the documentary world is once you have something that goes out that broadly, that Colorblind even played at the Gandhi Film Festival in India. Mm. It was amazing. It's like it's been fantastic. We had a lot of scenes all over in theaters too. But once, um, once you do that, I had a cousin uh, come to me from Detroit and goes, have you ever looked into your, my grandfather's tour of duty in Russia in uh, 1918? And I said, well, I know he was like a soldier called a polar bear. He goes, no, you don't get the story. I said, well, he told me it was really cold up there. And he goes, no, Pam. He goes, I'd be willing to put up the money if you make a documentary on the polar bear soldiers of northern Russia. Well, wow. as a producer, you go, wow, somebody's willing to put up the money. Okay. <laughs> um, it, so I started looking into it. And, and by then, I had studied screenwriting even more. And it was really interesting because we actually, I went around and I started my interviews. I went back to my beloved Detroit area where all these soldiers were from, interviewed my mom, who's a daughter of one of these soldiers, my grandfather, and um, interview uh, or video the ceremony every year at Whitechapel Cemetery in Detroit on Memorial Day. They have a tribute to these World War I soldiers who were left in Russia freezing under 60 degree below weather, fighting the first communists. Um, and they were left there seven months after World War I ended. Can you imagine that? It was wow. quite a story when I looked into it. So I decided to make this film. And I went and I spoke at VFW halls, and we raised quite a bit of money for it. And I was going to just bring it back to PBS. We even shot the winter scenes of our soldiers fighting the Bolsheviks, which were the communists, in a five-day blizzard in near northern Michigan. We lucked out and got a five-day blizzard. <laughs> it was amazing. And it was also from the writing process. I storyboarded everything out. And again, I used three-act structure, and I had 
20 hours of voiceovers of these soldiers' diaries. And just the editing process, I got it down to one hour, 56 minutes, which is exactly what PBS wants. And I had a number of people say, well, and I hope this inspires your writers, because I had a number of people say, well, you know, only Ken Burns does two-hour documentaries. And I'm thinking, no, I'm creating documentaries that move people. I am going to have confidence that I can get this out there. And sure enough, I did. We finished it. It was two hours. And I defied all the odds of just as an independent filmmaker. And it was played on close to 70 stations. And I think that one's still played today, too. That's called Voices of a Never-Ending Dawn. And that was a big writing process because I had people and families sending me, you know, beautiful passages of the diaries of their fathers and grandfathers. And we ended up, I, I think it's very moving that we have um, – a lot of veterans sitting there crying in theaters because it's, mm. I guess I always make tear jokes. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, well, those are, those do make great stories, you know, first of all. But it's so interesting because I had just interviewed a woman who wrote the story of the Romanovs. Okay, Helen Rappaport. Oh. And she has so many, you know, Romanoff books. It's, you know, it's crazy. But I, yeah. I, so when I was looking into this movie, I was like, you know what? Before I interviewed her, I would not have known what I know about it. <laughs> but yeah. I did not know that we left soldiers. So what was the what was the purpose of us leaving the soldiers behind? Was it to did they know to fight? Did that is that was their purpose was to fight the Bolsheviks or did yes. they leave them behind yes. as like to see what was going to go on, you know, to see to, no, to, no, no. to make sure. No, no, no. Okay, so my grandfather and all the guys in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin, mostly Michigan, they figured, these guys know winter, so they're <laughs> great in 60 degree below weather, right? Well, we never get 60 degree below in Michigan. So my right. grandfather thinks he's being shipped off, um, you know, to go to the, the front in France. But all of a sudden, they were told to get back on the boat. And then they loaded on all this winter gear and long underwear and all this Ooh. stuff. And the boat started. They, they didn't tell them until they were almost there. They go, where are we going? It was a secret mission because communism was starting in Russia. And Woodrow Wilson and the guys back here, he was president at the time, they mm -hmm. thought that this was going to be a bad thing. So they the guys get off in a place called Archangel Russia, this little village, like a little city. And I think I'm here today because my grandfather was an incredible carpenter from Italy, and they wouldn't let him go down to the front. They kept Guido Camponi up there, you know, fixing all the bridges and all the building, you know, making logs from the trees. He was an engineer. But the guys they shipped down 400 miles on the front had horrific battles with the Bolsheviks. And they build these block houses out of giant logs. And then by the time they build them, in would come the enemy. And sometime we had one story I cover in the movie is there were 16 Americans. They built this block house, and they were overtaken by 800 Bolsheviks. <gasps> and guess what? They held their own, and they, they, they won. So it was like the American forces and the American – because there was so much freedom in our thought. You know, they, they were just a, a smarter – Force. So I covered this and um, beautiful passages in the film from a woman that loved one of the soldiers. And um, I had some really great voiceover actors here in Irvine, um, California, uh, you know, do the moving passages. And then I went and shot with Michigan guys who were reenactors. We went and shot in that blizzard and we paired up the voices and, and it turned out very, very moving. That is unbelievable. What a story. I mean, that, that's, that's, and that's, an, that, oh. I, I am such a history person and oh, yeah. uh, military history. Like I'm like, oh my yeah, god, I have too. to see this. And and here's the, so okay. Do you have a website for that movie? Yes, it's called okay. www.polarbeardocumentary. All one word: polarbeardocumentary.com. Interesting stuff on that site. A awesome. lot of interesting things on that site. Yeah, I, I would figure. So, I would figure that that would be, you know, something you could do with it because of all the you know, the vets just love this, you know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, especially and, and today. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I meant especially because it is so hard for them to, you know, not anymore, but it was so hard for them to keep in touch. And, you know, and now you've got the ancestors of the vets, like I'm sure that are interested in in what their grandfathers did. 
Absolutely. And these guys, to this day and to their death, I remember going to polar bear reunions when I was in my 20s. I'd drive my grandpa, and he'd break down and cry. And I, I used to think, what went on there? What went on there? But it was they all suffered together. I mean, just imagine getting off in this strange place 60 days before World War I ended. They landed in September of 1918. The uh, World War I ended on what's now Veterans Day, November 11, 1918, and they didn't get to come home until June 1919. And it was only because their parents in Detroit petitioned Congress and said, bring our sons home. And it was the first time in American history that any, um, you know, regular folks impacted the foreign policy of the U.S. They brought them home. They were just left there, and the parents couldn't figure out why. But they were basically, you know, killing the Bolsheviks. But how many guys died? There were a, such a number of them that died up there after the war was over. So, anyway, yeah. so what I want to say is anywhere you have a story in your family or, again, You'll know it's a high concept when people, um, when you, you tell the story to people and, you know, is it marketable? Is it, I knew we had a huge veterans audience, right? Mm -hmm. um, military audience. Uh, you know, who is it for? Is it unique? Does it have a hook in it? And it did left there after seven months after the war was over in 60 degree below weather and they were dying up there. Uh, anyway, and, oh, and, and it's a crazy, and it's crazy that the that the parents had you know got together and decided you know what if they wouldn't have you know like right. the fact that they felt like they could because I would think you know you would think oh I can't you know what am I going to say how am I going to be able to change that how are we going to be able to get, you know change the president's mind you know so that and that's that's an incredible yeah. story so yeah okay. yeah and we show. Part of the mother's petitioning and all that, we did oh. the enactment of that. It was, it's very moving. Wow, I can't and after that, that after, after all that writing, I thought, you know, I should go take some formal writing classes because my stuff is getting <laughs> I don't know how you could think that, but okay. So then you were like, okay, no, are you kidding? I have learned so much. Yeah, and there's a big difference between writing a documentary um, you know, writing a documentary and writing a screenplay. So I went to Playhouse West in uh, Hollywood. In fact, it's one of my classmates. I'm a student of Sanford Meisner from many decades back, and I also am an acting teacher as well. And I went up there, and I took a great class from a, a teacher named Tony Savant, and he has an online class that is just the basics. And um, and I, I think your your um, listeners can see that it's Tony Savant screenwriting, and if they look that up, they'll see it. And it sounds very example. familiar, actually. You know, I go yeah. through a lot. Tony I see Fred. a lot of the. Yeah, I see a lot of the. The I get emails from them too, so I, it does sound yeah. familiar. Well, Tony's been an act. Tony and Bob Carnegie um, have been. Oh my God, they taught. Turn on your TV, and those are all their students who made a success at, on, on Hawaii Five O. You know, and you name it, they've taught them. And uh, their writing class was excellent. And now it's just online. And after that, I went on to do the pro series at Screenwriting You. And, you know, some of it was for you, but I, I learned so much. And now I'm doing the master class, which is all about taking your screenplays to market. And I just started doing that because I've been doing documentaries. I've done a lot of industrial films, written them, produced them, directed them. I can't even count how many of those I've done over the years. But I really recommend that people get trained and find a good place to get trained because it's a tough market out there for screenplays. I find, I find the documentary market through PDF, although, and, and all the film festivals. I recommend film festivals no matter what they make. That's a great experience. Well, and I always think that, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of kids that are in, you know, college taking screenwriting, and I, I find yeah. that, like, their biggest question is, like, is there a way to make money screenwriting that I don't have to have another job? Like, is there a way to make this my job? Because so many of the screenwriters are like, okay, well, I work at night and I send these off and I go to the festivals and, you know, but I also have my day job. But, I mean, what, right. what would you say to that? What would, how would you answer What I would that? say, I'll tell you, the answer that I found is Hal Crosman Screenwriting You. He teaches exactly I mean, he's done like over 800 interviews. Great guy, too. Great communicator. That is an online school. But you have, in the master class, you have one night where you're on the phone two to three hours like it's a, a class. 
I have not found anyone that teaches how to market your screenplays and why producers are saying yes or no after they look at the third page. He gives you, mm. he lets you inside the mind of the producers and their readers. You know the people that read and they, they throw them a screenplay and say, let me know what you think of it. And right. I'm telling you, especially in the pro series and then the master class, the master class is where you really learn about marketing your screenplays and making it a full-time job. And he also teaches you how to take writing assignments because sometimes you're marketing your screenplays and they come back and they say, hey, can you fix this script for me? Or can you come in here and we'll brainstorm? Hal teaches you all, Hal Carlsman teaches you all those things. It's really tremendous. So I highly recommend that because I have the same questions. Um, you know, I've been doing marketing all my life. But marketing a, a screenplay, um, marketing the documentary I found to be easy because I've done marketing. Marketing the screenplay, they're requiring things on by page one, by page three, by, you know. You know yes. Also. And yes. you better know what it is. And Hal actually takes you to market in the master class. And you learn, like 40 of you go at once, and you learn from what everybody else is doing. So it's really a very interesting ride. And if people want to become professional writers, I recommend that. Do the pro series, which is six months. The master class is online. It's a year and a half. But, wow, there's different phases to it, and you go to market twice with two different screenplays. And what's crazy now is that it is easier for people because of being able to do it online. You know, I oh, yeah. that it's, you know, like how great is that that they don't have to fly out to L.A. or go to NYU or, you know, try to find a school that's going to teach them how to be a screenwriter. They can go online and find these great people who are teaching. You know, I think, I think that that's, that's changed. And, and I love when I, when I talk to screenwriters, I love to, to I love the hope in that there are so many outlets now with Netflix and Amazon original, yes. and, you know, the, the, it's, it, we're at a time when this is so wide open. Like, don't you feel like we're like on this brink of like way more movies can be made way more than what we're, you know, than just going to the major studios. Now everybody wants to make movies and, and it's awesome, you know, because we absolutely. Like, and I, I want to this. more movies, you know? <laughs> yes. And when you're sure of what your genre is that you're writing and you take it to the exact right producers, now you find something really, really that's hot. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, before, special. if you don't have that information on who's looking for what, another thing I recommend is, and probably some of your writers that listen to this know, is virtual pitch fest. Um, very economical. You, you actually pay something and you will get an answer. And um, you go in your genre and there's a list on their website of, oh, God, what is there, like two, three hundred companies? I'm, something like that. And you match your screenplay up with what they're looking for. I mean, your wow. chances of selling something are so much better um, when you do it that way. So I recommend that, too. But really, I recommend that people need to get inside the heads of the producers and find out exactly what they're looking for and why they put a script down or throw it away or why they get, how it can, your script can become what's called a page turner where they can't wait to make that movie. And, uh, and that's the goal of the master class uh, in screenwriting you. And I find it really, really helpful. I have a producer interested in one of my screenplays just from going to market the first time. So that's oh. really great. I, I recommend it. Yeah. That's that's awesome. I know because you always see this vision of like um, these scriptwriters, like they get a hun- you know a stack of a hundred screenplays, and they get to the first page and they're like, nope, and they don't even you know, and you're like, oh, they just threw that crap. They didn't even get past. Well, you know one what? Two, you know. I now learned why they do that. I now learned why they do that. There are certain specific marketing decisions, and Hal Crosman ah. teaches you to include. Um, include those decisions in your screenplay. And that's all right. I can and say. The rest of it, you have yeah. to take the class. Yeah, to pay for it, right. 
Yeah, yeah. I, of yeah. course. But I, but you know what? At least it makes me realize that it isn't just based on that reader. Like it's not him just saying, "Nope, I don't like it." Nope, I don't. You know, at least oh, no, they no, know. Looking, you know, like people yeah. can hear and say, "Oh, there's a reason." Like he had a reason. It just wasn't that right. he just wasn't feeling it that day. Like he actually is looking for something, and I think oh, no, that it, it all people boils, hope. It, yeah, it all boils down to they're looking for these specific marketing decisions and once you learn them you're, they're easy to see and you write your script or go back and put those things in your old scripts because if they're going to go out and get investors to invest millions of dollars those things have to be there because they know it won't sell otherwise do you see right yeah so it's it's really really important that people learn you know we you could write forever um, you know, recently I saw the movie Safe House, and Safe House was that, that guy had been writing. I'm sorry, I forget his name right, by now, but that writer had been writing for ten years, and suddenly he became aware of the marketing decisions that go into a script, and every one of those marketing decisions is in Safe House, and it made a ton of money. So that you know, it's a money game, and if those decisions aren't there from a business perspective and creative perspective, but mostly from a business perspective. Those decisions aren't in your script and revealed by a certain time in some instances, then basically they're not going to go out and make the money for it because they could lose big time. Right, and the, and the marketing is amazing, like what they can do with marketing now. Like my son, who's 17, came to me this week. He's like, Mom, this weekend we're going to see Get Out. I'm like, I never even heard of it. He's like, I said, what's it about? He's like, I don't know, but I saw a really cool video on, you know, whatever he's on, on Twitter, and it looks really cool, so we're going. And I was like, wow, like, see, he doesn't even know what it's about. He just saw some. <laughs> yeah, he saw the trailer, and it hit his age group. You know what I mean? <laughs> Right, but it was like, yeah. wow, like he could make that decision like that quickly. Like I want to see that movie. So yeah, it's you know, it's a crazy world. It's and and it's, but it's out there, and and that's what I love about you know that even you just telling me that 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 people can go on this and find out what the what the thing is that's going to draw people to your script. That in itself is worth a ton of gold. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, you know, since I, I've taken this master class, I've gone back to some of my old scripts and go, wow, you know what's missing on page one to three? Or, wait a minute, what what age group is this for? How can I reinforce this? Or whatever the other marketing decisions are. But you can go back and, and take a script that was rejected or that was not called, just sitting there and turn it in to something that a producer will call a page turner. And they go, yeah, I want to make this film. And again, make sure they're sending the script to people who do that genre. That's right. really important. Right. And you'll That's see that a, yeah. on, if they just well, if they just go on virtual pitch fest, they'll see that. You know, they'll see all the producers that you can contact through virtual pitch fest, and um, exactly what they're looking for. So your chances wow. become much higher because of very what what is it like? I've heard one year I heard there were forty thousand scripts that hit, hit Hollywood. Now this year I heard hit a hundred thousand. And 1% are made. So the idea is, what do you have to do to get to that 1%? Right. And that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's so exciting because they are getting more more and more. And, more. and you know, I only see it increasing, you know, and it, and it's exciting. Yeah. It's it's an exciting time for, for everybody in the industry. And, and for us people, you know, for us who just watch them, it's exciting, you know. So I mean, yeah. you gave us so much good – oh, my gosh, Pam, you've been so helpful. And I oh, love good. all the advice. Yes, and, and I'm so happy that – um, that you're getting some, you know, you're getting to a movie that's going to be made, and and that's awesome. That's like yes. a dream, right? Yes, it is. It, it <laughs> is. And you know, success always breeds success. So the idea is get your foot in the door with one, and then watch what happens. That's what happened on the documentaries too. Yes, yes, I, and I can't wait. I'm going to share. Uh, we're going to share these so people can go on there because I. I want to see both of them, and I want to be able to see them. So I want to go on there and get the the DVDs and be able to watch them. And you know, they they sound amazing. Both of them sound absolutely amazing. So thank well, you good. so much for helping us today. Oh, you're very welcome. I so enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, and please keep me in updated. You know, as soon as you have anything else to share, I would love to share it on on everything I have. And you know, we'll we'll get it out there. And I, I would be more than happy to do that. 
Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Okay. Well, have a great day. Thank you again. You too. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.